Hey, everybody, glad you're out there. It's your buddy Sean Hannity here, and it is my distinct honor, privilege, pleasure uh, to be doing the live signing event for my buddy, my pal, my friend, Stephen A. Smith, the book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. By the way, mine is all marked up because I read it cover to cover. I can show you all the pages that are marked up. I put it all in there. I rip pages out like this um, so I can interview Stephen A. Look, here's why we do a live signing. Many people, when they buy a book, you want a first edition, you want a, a signed copy, and we set up a, a special website that you're on, stephenasmithbook.com, and you can order the book right here online. Stephen A. signs it himself. Uh, he already signed about 25,000. I think those are mostly gone. Uh, it's been a top bestseller now since it was released this week, uh, and I give a warm, friendly, Welcome to Stephen A. Smith. He has a hard time acknowledging that we're really friends in real life. Uh, <laughs> get over that tonight because here I am to interview my buddy and my pal. Yes. My What's up, my man? How you doing, man? I always appreciate you, man. Obviously, you're a very, very busy man. You high powered and all of this stuff. So I am honored that I have the great Sean Hannity taking oh, care yeah. of me. Uh, okay, I'm not buying any of that BS. <laughs> uh, but you know, the, the thing is, and I want to get right into the book, and we started this on television, you know, just in the last yeah. segment of the show tonight, and I've known you, how many years have we known each other? 20 years? Yeah, about, uh, close to 20 years. Close to right. 20 years. Yeah. And, and we kind of hit it off, you know, almost from day one, from the get-go. Yeah. And we, we became friends, and it's been a fun relationship. You know, you'll shoot me a text or on my radio show or TV show telling me how dumb I am. I shoot you a text yeah. and you're doing your show and say, you know, lay off my buddy Tebow yeah. or, you know, or or I agree with you. I recently, you know, you were really going hard uh, and, and advocating for more African-American coaches uh, in the NFL. I totally agreed with you. And, you know, uh, we agree, we disagree, but we stay friends. Why? How is that? How do you explain your friendship to me to your friends? Um, I, I, I just think that, you know, uh, first of all, the way I explain it to them is, is, is really nothing. I always let them know uh, that I think that when it comes to politics, uh, half of your opinions are crazy. But half the time you do make a lot of sense and you're right. Uh, but more importantly, you're a good guy. And, and I always tell people that. The fact of the matter is, is that, you know, people, friends, family members and stuff like that disagree all the time. Why is that a reason not to be friends with somebody? Because you might not share their ideology completely. You might have a different perspective on something. That's one of the biggest problems that I think exists in the world today. People think that because you disagree with one another, you must be enemies. And, and I blame a lot of that stuff, not only on the households, but on some of the nonsense that goes on on Capitol Hill. But at the end of the day, it's in our hands to make the world a better place. And the way to do that is respecting people's opinions. And if poor folks are willing to talk to one another, that is what truly will make the world a better place. The dialogue, the conversation, and the ability to disagree and still get along. And that is certainly you and I, because at least 60% of the times I disagree with you. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I, I can't stand the fact that we're as divided a country as we are. I don't like identity politics, as you know. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I've been pushing for is I think the churches need to take a bigger role in, in bringing people together. Um, I've seen so often in, in many towns and cities, and you know, I've lived around the country doing my crazy radio career. You know, you often have all these Christian churches, but, you know, one part of town, it's predominantly African-American. Another part, it's predominantly Hispanic-American. Uh, another part of town is predominantly white American. And I'm like, why don't these, like, pastors adopt a church, and one week you come to our church, one week we'll go to your church. You know, we all believe in in, in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. It'd be a great way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But I digress. Um, by the way, if you have any questions for Stephen A., uh, we will gladly get some of those on during the course of this live signing. And stephenabooks.com, you can get an autographed copy of Stephen's book. Let me let me start with where I started on TV tonight as it relates to the book. Okay. And all these years that I've known you, I never knew your background, your story, and it really touched me. 
because I had no idea how hard your life growing up was. I had no idea the pain that you experienced as a child. And you go into chapter and verse and in detail and all of this. And my heart broke for you because I know you as the success. I know you as Stephen A. I didn't know you as, you know, just a, a kid next door. Um, and in particular, I'll, get, I'll give a quick summary and I'll let you fill in all the gaps. You sure. know, in third grade, you failed and you had to go to summer school. They almost held you back. Yeah. In fourth grade, they did hold you back. Yes. And what I brought up tonight is, and you can go into what as much detail about your dad as you want, but you overheard a conversation with your dad and your mom and your dad had a lot of issues and your mom was your rock in your life. Your sisters were your rock in your life. Why don't you tell us, and I'll sit back and listen and let everybody hear your that story of yours. Well, I got left back for the second time, and this time was held back in the fourth grade, as you actually accurately stated. Um, and I was the only kid on the in the neighborhood to get left back. And so the kids were laughing at me and making fun of me and that kind of stuff, which is predictable. And you understand that as a kid, that's going to happen. But I was humiliated and I went to the back porch and I was crying on the back porch. There was a door separating the back porch from the kitchen. There was a window that was open so you could hear conversations that were coming from the kitchen. My mother and father were in the kitchen and my mother was speaking to my father about how sad she was that I suffered, you know, that I suffered another setback being in, getting left back and that we had to figure out something, you know, to do for Steven. And my father said, you know, just face it, the boy ain't smart. He just doesn't have it. He's never going to be anything. You just need to get used to that right now. And that's what he said. And I remember him saying that to her and how devastating it was for me to hear that. And she came and she looked out the window. She saw my face and she just cringed. And I remember she just looked horrified that I heard him say that. And then a couple of days later, so she took me to the movies to see Grease with John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. And that's the only movie my mother has ever taken me to in my life. And I asked her, why was she taking me to the movie? She said, because I want you. She said, because I love you. And I want you to know that always, that your mother loves you. And wow. she left me. Yeah. But what I did was I used it as a source of motivation because my father thinking that I was a lost cause and I was dumb and I just didn't have it. It made me more motivated than I've ever been in my life um, to prove somebody wrong, to make them out to be a liar, uh, to erase those doubts from somebody's head. And that mentality has propelled me throughout my life because everywhere I've been, anything that I've wanted bad enough, whenever I run into doubters, I hearken back to my father saying those words to my mother and how my attitude was from that point forward. And I'm 55 years old now. And the attitude that I had that day when I heard him say that about me is the same attitude I have to this day whenever doubt is getting my path. Let me, before I get to what the issue ultimately was and how this is a tragedy to triumph book, I want to talk about your mom and dad because you talk about them both in detail in the book. And your mom was your rock. And you're right. You told, you write in the book, you tell the story. She took you to see Greece after she knew you heard that painful conversation, the painful words of your dad. Um, you start the book talking about your mom's death. Yeah. And you also mention in that part about your dad's behavior that day. And then later yeah. you talk about other problems, issues that he had. But your mom wanted him by her side as, as she was on her deathbed. Yeah. So to the extent that you're comfortable and you want to discuss, you know, let's talk about mom and let's talk about dad. Well, first things first, anything that's in the book, I'm comfortable talking because, you know, I'm not running from any of these issues. And to be quite frank with you, I've spent far too much time in my life running from these issues, whether it would be because my mother didn't want me to talk about it or because it was too painful for me to address. And I'm just over that. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, when my mother was waning as she was transitioning, um, you know, even before then, right before then, she desperately wanted my father to be by her side. Um, so much so that when he would watch his Westerns or he would watch a Yankees baseball game, 
right up until the night she passed away and he was watching game one of the NBA finals between the Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers. This is um, the night she, this is the night she died. That's correct. And um, he, did not, he did not treat your mom well, right? Came upstairs, came upstairs, he just rubbed on arms. He said, everything's going to be all right. And then turned around and went back downstairs and continued watching his West, his old Westerns and started and, and, and watched the NBA finals. And so that was emblematic of the kind of behavior he had exhibited throughout the years, whatever tough times would arrive. Uh, my mother was left to deal with it on her own uh, unless she had the assistance of one of her six children, either my four older sisters or myself or my brother at one point in time or another before he left home. So that was just the way that it was. Uh, we understood that we were appalled by it, uh, but it was a consistent behavior on his part and was something that never really changed. And so we grew to accept it over time. You said in the book, that there's not a single day since your mom passed that you don't cry once a day because you think about your mom. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful, the impact that she had on you. And the woman you're describing sounds like a saint. Well, you know, my mother was no nonsense. The title of the book is dedicated to her because she was a straight shooter. Um, and my mother was just, um, she was my rock. She was my angel. She's the greatest woman I've ever known. Um, and she was somebody that was very, very big on accountability. Um, so much about me in terms of how I am comes from her. I'm one of those people that I like to deal with stuff head on and get it over with rather than. No, not, not you. You like to go right at it. <laughs> me. Uh, I, I, I've always been that way. But the reason I was that way was because my mother taught me a long time ago. It's better to force for, force someone to live with your truth than for you to have to live with your own lies. She said it imprisons you. It weakens you. It demoralizes you. It deteriorates you from within because you know that you're not doing what's right. And if you fess up to it and own up to it, even if you do wrong, you'll get tired of it because you had to own it and you have to live with it. And she said, when you do that, it forces others to live with your truth rather than you living with your lies and you're better off for it. So I've always dealt, dealt, dealt with things that way. I knew that. And my mother just tried to shape my, and, and you know, shape my personality the way that she did. And I owe her so much because she was the one person in the world that loved me unconditionally. Um, and it was always the case. So when she passed away, Sean, the devastating part is that I've never been married. And so if you're married and you find someone, well, while your mother's here, well, that's somebody that you've passed the baton to, one would think. But when that's not the case, for the first time in my life, when my mother passed away, the very next day, I sat on my couch and I was like, I'm all alone because the one person that I knew that loved me unconditionally is gone. And I never looked, I never, ever, ever in my life thought about that until the day after she died. And she that was, it was so yeah. devastating. She didn't, she thought you might write this book one day. Yes. And she had a request. Well, she didn't want you to write it while she was alive. Why? My mother was very private. West Indian woman born and raised in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. Um, uh, my grandparents were mixed. My grandfather was black. My grandmother was white. Um, my mother was incredibly private. She didn't have anything to hide. She just felt adamant that her business was her business and that your business should be your business. She did not believe in airing private business to the public. She understood that the world had changed. Things were modified. People write books, people talk on talk radio. They do all of these kind of things that so she got that. But her whole thing was she was born in 1941 and you kept your business to yourself. You minded your business and she was a stickler for that. So her mentality was, okay, you're growing. People want to get to know more about you, et cetera, et cetera. She said, and I know you, you're going to talk about me because of, you just love talking about me. She said, but when you're praising me, inevitably you're going to talk about your father and we know how you're going to speak about him. Do not do that until I'm dead and gone. Do not do that when I'm alive. 
I do not want that. And she made me promise and vow to her that I wouldn't do it. I believe it was early 2011. Wow. So let me let me go through. I'm gonna I'm skipping around. I'm gonna go back to fourth grade in a minute, but I want to stay on this point. Uh, she got to see your success. She also got to see you fired. Yeah. And, and by the way, just for the record, at the time I stood up for you. And yes, you did. I did. And I've never called for anybody's firing. I've never called for anybody to be canceled. I never called for any boycott. I believe in freedom. I believe in liberty. And if you don't like what somebody's saying, you don't have to listen. You don't have to watch. But there came a point you were off TV for two long years. Yeah. And your mother, you know, really didn't have a lot of sympathy for you. And you tell a great story about that in the book. You, I want you to talk about that a little bit. I got let go by ESPN in May of 2009. My contract was due to end June 30th of that year. They said, don't bother waiting. Your last day is May 9th. Um, they said the decision has been made to let you go. And it was not a unilateral decision, obviously giving me the impression that there were a plethora of people that wanted me gone. I was devastated, very much so. Um, I thought it was gross, grossly unfair to me that that had happened. And I was furious. I was embarrassed. I had a just a, 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 just an array of emotions. And I rather than go home to my house, uh, because at that time I had a house in South Jersey, and growing up poor in Hollis, Queens, to me, you know, I was living pretty well in South Jersey. I had a 5,500 square foot house. I was living in it by myself. And I did not want to go home. I went back to my bunk bed that I grew up in, wow. in my mother's house right next door to her. And I just laid there for three days. After two days there, my mother woke up one morning and cooked me breakfast um, like she always did. And with my toasted bagel with extra butter and my hot tea with milk and sugar, um, <laughs> so she had a handheld mirror on a tray. And I asked her, what was that? She said, that's for you. I'm just wondering when you're going to look at yourself. And then she proceeded to tell me, remind me rather, of the time she had heard me, whether it was speaking to her or my sisters, everybody in the house, whether it was on the phone with colleagues, contemporaries or somebody else whether it was me alluding to subjects about my bosses and stuff like that, she reminded me that I was very negative, that I had a very bad attitude, um, that I was constantly pointing the finger at other people, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, I know that you're not a boss, but I know that if somebody was around you acting like that, you wouldn't want them around. So why should your bosses want you around? And she said, I wouldn't, she said, I wouldn't want to work with you if you were that kind of person and you had that kind of attitude. And she really tore into me and just said, I'm not here to defend your bosses, but what you've done is indefensible. I expected more from you. You need to grow up, you need to mature, and you need to understand that they have a right to want the culture in their business to be what they want it to be. And if you don't wanna go along, you need to go somewhere else. They're not wrong in what they did to you. And it forced me to reflect on all the things that I had said and done prior to my dismissal, to the non-renewal of my contract. And when believe, I- Do you believe you deserved it in retrospect? Did you deserve to be fired? In, in retrospect, I will never believe that I deserved to be fired because I was never insubordinate and I always performed. But I did have a bloated view of myself. I had no right to think that I was worth what I was worth when I didn't even understand the business to know my worth. Ratings and revenue was not something I paid enough attention to. Ad sales, the kind of money I'm generating for the network, what my cachet really, really equates to. I did not have any of that information shown because I didn't have a team. I didn't have a manager like I do now with my guy, Rashawn McDonald. I didn't have a super agent like I do right now with the guys at WME and Mark Shapiro and John Rosen and Josh Byatt. I didn't have a team. And because of that, all I did, my definition of popularity was people screaming my name in the streets. Now, I must be popular. I'm known everywhere I go. 
but they were the ones who had the real numbers. So they had a right to come to me with any number that they wanted to, because I couldn't disprove whatever they equated my value to be. But I wasn't thinking like that. I was stuck with emotions and I wasn't paying enough attention to the facts. And I ended up getting burnt for it. And I had to accept that reality because I couldn't go to anyone and say what I was worth because I didn't know. Amazing. I'm going to go backwards now. We started sure. this interview with you were held back in the third grade, but you were able to advance to fourth grade because you went to summer school. Then, yes. you were held, then you were held back in the fourth grade. Yep. Then you described the conversation that you overheard with your mom and dad that was devastating. And your father saying, just get used to it. He's, he, he's, he's not that smart, which I think has got to be for any kid in fourth grade devastating. Um, and I want to advance the story. Sure. They didn't call it dyslexia at the time. Right. It turns out you were dyslexic, which by the way, is now we know a pretty common condition. I yeah. would probably even argue that between ADHD and dyslexia, I probably had a little combination of both going on in my life. I certainly, if it was a boring topic, I had no interest in, I was not going to be paying attention in class that day right. when I was interested. Let's talk about when they finally discovered, wait a minute, there's something going on here. And then your sisters come into your life and other, and your mother was a big part of it. Now, just a little backtrack. Your mom, like my mom, was working 16-hour shifts, seven yeah. days a week. My mom was a prison guard. Your mom had two separate jobs that she was working, exhausted. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even say that our moms had a life. Yeah. And I, I right. never, it was horrible. But when did they find out that, hold on a second, there's a reason he's being held back. There's a reason he's not reading at grade level. And we can fix this. My older sister, Linda, she was a valedictorian in school. She was absolutely brilliant. And she would ultimately become an educator. And Linda, when I got left back and she saw the misery on my face and she heard about what my father had said to my mother, because obviously my mother had gone and told her what I had overheard, Linda took it upon herself to literally tutor me every day, every day. Uh, or I will tell you that it spanned at least a year where she never missed a day to sit me down and to make me read to her and to make me explain and to figure out what was wrong. It was her and it was a family friend by the name of Tiver. He was a, the older brother of one of my best childhood buddies, Ronnie Robertson, growing up. And Tiver would teach me separately. He didn't even know what Linda was doing and he was teaching me and he was brilliant. And so Linda figured out that it was dyslexic, which was something that we learned to really, really describe later on. But she had repetition, uh, just doing stuff over and over again. And as I detail in the book, I have no idea how she do it, how she did it, how she figured it out. All I know is that she had me sit down with her every single day for at least a half hour to an hour and read to her and then make me tell her what I just read to her. And she would explain to me where I skipped the word or skipped the sentence and what was relevant and what was not. And when I peeled something from what I read that didn't make any sense, she explained to me why it made no sense and where would you get this from? Why were you thinking that? And then she'd go back and read it herself and see where I missed the sentence or see where I missed the word or see how I would gloss over a paragraph and just completely miss it altogether. And she pointed out all of these things and said, see, you missed this here, you missed this there, but you caught this here. Why did you catch this here? Because you were more interested in what you read here than you were what you read there. And then she handed me a dictionary and she said, I'm going to make it even more complicated for you. She said, part of the reason was disinterest. Part of the reason is lack of confidence. The minute you see a word you don't comprehend, you don't understand, you fade, you give up. She said, we're going to put an end to that right now. She handed me a dictionary and she said, I don't care what word it is. Any word you read that you don't understand, you look it up in the dictionary. You see the sentence structure in which it is used. 
and then you read it over. And Sean, I'm 55 years old. Do you know that to this day I still do that? I still do it. Well, you know, you're describing in your sister. I, by the way, I want to meet your sister because she's a rock star. It's almost like she was um, way ahead of her time. And because she loved her brother so much, she stepped in, not only gave her time, and she's the valedictorian. My, by the way, my mom was of our high school class. And again, she became a prison guard. Figure that one out. She didn't have much knowledge. But the, the interesting thing to me is, is that she figured out dyslexia when nobody knew the name at, at that time, if I'm not mistaken, right? right. Not and to my knowledge. Overcome it for you. I mean, she sounds like a genius to me. Well, let me let me advance the story a little bit. And I want to go into a moment, and we touched on it very briefly tonight, but we touched on it more on my radio show, where your sister's doing all this work, you're overcoming your reading impediment, and you're becoming smart, but you always were smart. And a teacher, I forget his name, brings you and your mother into the classroom, wants to yep. talk to mom. The, the bottom line, I'll let you tell the story, is uh, Mrs. Smith, your son is extraordinarily smart, and he's going to be a star. Now, when he's not interested in the topic, I'm not going to get anything out of him. However, when he's interested, he's locked in and with a, with a passion that I've never seen in anybody. He will be a star if he finds what he's good at, what he loves. Tell that Mr. Mr. Caravan was his name. He was my seventh grade social studies teacher. And I liked social studies because we used to talk about a lot of different issues and it was very, very conversational. It wasn't some monotonous kind of class where you were bored to death or whatever. It was issues being discussed from a social perspective and how uh, he would choose to address them. And so a lot of times he saw me raising my hand and challenging and really articulating my thoughts pretty well with things that I was interested in. And with things that I wasn't interested in, I wouldn't raise my hand at all. I'd just sit there for the hour. And so he took it upon himself to notice that and to, pay, and, and to pinpoint the kind of things that I loved. It was, it was an issue related to sports, I loved it. If there was an issue related to politics, I loved it. If it was an issue related to science, I wasn't interested. If it was an interest, you know, uh, uh, you know, relevant to math, unless it was dollar signs, I wasn't interested, you know. So he picked up on all of these things. And Here we are. Show me the money. Go ahead. That's right. He figured out, he figured out that I was a different beast when I was interested and motivated. And so when my mother came up to the school, he said, your son is smart. The problem is he got left back and there's a confidence issue. He never fails to remind anybody. Most kids would hide the fact that they've gotten left back. Your son tells everybody he got left back. He holds on to it. It's a crutch. And he said his confidence has been shaken by that. He said, but he's not dumb at all. If you find what this kid is interested in, he is something special. I've seen it. He said, find what he's interested in and have him do that. And you will have a star in your hands. And when he said that, that was the first time I had ever heard anyone talk about me like that. And it really, really elevated my confidence even more, which really benefited me down the line because it made me confident my dad. Maybe even too much. Um, I think maybe, no, I'm kidding. Um, but I, I, in all seriousness, wow, what, what, a po what a powerful story, honestly. And this is the stuff that, you know, we've been friends all these years and I've known you all these years that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it, you, look, we, we, we're both working, you know, radio, TV, TV, radio, travel in the country. You even mentioned in the book, one of the main reasons you never got married is because you knew you were on the road six months a year and, and you did not want to put at risk a family that way. Um, and and you, you, that went back to the issues involving your dad. Yeah. Let's advance the story from where we left off in terms of your career and your mom. And you told the story about her giving you your breakfast with your extra butter, whatever that means. That's right. But, but you get, you well, had to toast and bagel with extra butter. It actually tastes good, Sean. It actually tastes, it's not really good. Butter, it tastes but, okay, I try to be, eat a little bit healthy. I work out every day. All right, but that's a different issue. But, 
but I, I want to go and the, your mom held up a mirror. This is after you got fired at ESPN. And take us from there two years down the road. Well, first of all, you're doing radio in the interim. I don't want to forget that. We're both radio yeah. guys. And right. by the way, I do need to, as a radio guy to stop. It's Stephen A. Smith book.com. Welcome to our live signing. And this book is a tragedy to triumph book, um, overcoming some of the most incredible obstacles in his youth uh, to become the great star that he is today. Great friend of mine, personal friend of mine. And I learned so much about you in this book. It, it blew my mind. I could not put the book down for a second. And it's a book that will help every single human being. If you have children, it will help you. By the way, I don't know how it's going to help my son, Patrick. My son, Patrick, is your biggest fan. Mm -hmm. And you are, you are the single biggest critic of his favorite team, which is the Dallas Cowboys. He's yes, that's probably, true. He's probably watching right now. He will be the first person to send in a note asking you a question and saying yeah. why you are coming down on his Cowboys. Uh, yeah. After all, they had a great game last night. but They got four days. They got four days left to celebrate. They got four days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I think I'll take a yeah. bet on Patrick's behalf. I'm, I'm going with the, with the Cowboys. I want my son's team to win. But let, let's let's start with, so you're fired. Your yeah. mom calls you out. She's not letting you letting you blame others. She's not letting you sulk. She's not letting you feel sorry for yourself. She hands you a mirror and says, look at yourself and what you did wrong. What a powerful yeah. moment on her part. What a loving moment. It's tough love, but it's tough. It's it real. Like love. It didn't feel like love at that moment. I openly confess it didn't. I, I know it was. Please, I know it was. But it didn't feel that way. It, it, it was like, man, this it stings because, first of all, it's your mama. And if you're a man and you love your mama, you're going to just listen and you're going to take it because that's what you do when it's your mama. But when you know she's right, it really, really stings. And, you know, when she said what she said to me, it forced me to look at all. I mean, I had to look at all the relationships that I had all the things that I said to people and why. And it really, really shapes and formulates how, you know, I, I deal with people to this day because a lot of times in the past, man, if like, if I was, I, I knew that my humanity was always attached to me, that I tried to be a decent person, but damn it, I didn't have much patience. And if you didn't get it, that's your problem. And that was mis just my attitude. And my mother was like, so what if somebody was like that with you? If somebody comes to you and they don't know. It's one thing if they think they know and they don't want to listen. Okay, that's fine. That's different. But if they come to you and they really don't understand and they know that you do or believe that you do and they want to give you an opportunity to explain for them, what if it's one of your bosses? What if it's one of your colleagues? Why would you just shove it aside? Why can't you think about something beyond yourself? And it's not that she felt I was always that way, but she felt that it got to a point at ESPN when I became that way, because I was so busy pointing the finger at what they were doing to me that I wasn't asking why, what am I doing to contribute to the demise of my career that was taking place before my very eyes. And then it reminded me of a warning that I got from Mr. George Bodenheimer, the former president of ESPN and ABC Sports, uh, who is one of the most phenomenal individuals I've ever, one of the kindest, most gentle human beings I've ever encountered in my life, in my life, who treated me with nothing but dignity and respect from the moment he met me. And months before I was fired, he called me into his office and he says, I'm very fond of you. That's why we're having this conversation. I'm hearing these things about you. What's going on? And I told him what he was hearing was wrong that these people were lying on me. And my attitude in, in terms of what I had expressed to him, he, did, he wasn't taken aback or offended by it, but he did say to me, there are people who oversee you. They may answer to me, but they're still your bosses. And if they feel this way about you, how long do you think that's gonna work for you? And he warned me very gently, very respectfully, but nevertheless, it was a very vivid warning and I didn't heed it. And so when my mother comes along 10 months later and 
she's getting on me. She also took the moment to remind me of that meeting and said, this is the president of the network who you adored that gave you a heads up and you still didn't listen. She said, look at yourself. And I thought about all of those things and I just had to eat it. And I knew that I had a long road ahead of me towards resurrecting my career because it wasn't just about my career. It was about mending those fences, those relationships. That's why I had to come back to ESPN, Sean, because by letting me go, I essentially felt blackballed. So even if I went somewhere else, the residue of why I got left go would have been left out there. And so to me, the only way to make this right was to do such phenomenal work wherever I went that they would have no choice but to want me back. And when they did bring me back, I would use that as an opportunity to mend those fences that I had severed. What a powerful story. Two, two great influences in your life. Ben Franklin had a famous saying, the sting in any rebuke is the truth. And your mom and the head of ESPN told you the truth. Um, so you're out, you're you're off TV for two years. I think you went to Fox Radio, if I'm not I went mistaken. To Fox Sports Radio for a year. I went to Fox Sports Radio for a year and then ESPN. I was gone for nearly two years. Um, okay. From May of, of 2009 to February of 2011, um, I worked at Fox for a year, and then I returned to ESPN in February of 2011. Right. So let me ask you, when you get back, but first let's talk a little bit about the process. So you're gone for two years. You're doing your best work. You've done a lot of self-reflection, introspection. Um, you come out a better person. Uh, how did you begin the discussion or, or did they approach you and were they skeptical? Were they going to get the old Stephen A. Smith back or did you have to tell them and explain to them what you did wrong? Did you, were you as forthright as you're being on this interview? Were you that forthright with them when you were looking to go back? No, um, but I didn't need to be. Dave Roberts is uh, was an executive at ESPN Radio in New York who was always a supporter of mine and it kept in contact monthly. When I departed from ESPN Radio in New York, 62% of my audience left with me. <laughs> when I returned yeah. in 2011, 62% of the audience returned. Wow. Dave knew that that was going to be the case. Uh, he was a black man who was incredibly supportive of me, and he had gained their faith and their trust. And he told them that he wanted me back. And they said, OK, but he's not coming back on television because they knew I loved television more than I loved radio at the time. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to keep me off radio. And they came to me and, and not only did they do that, but in New York, if you're working on a radio show, particularly in my time slots, you would get, I would tell you about four to 500,000 per show in a market like New York and LA. I was getting a grand total of $400,000 for two shows. I did two hours in New York, and then immediately after that, I did two hours of radio in L.A., a combined four hours for a, com for a grand total of $400,000. I was being grossly underpaid. So it was a message to, again, humble me, um, but still take advantage of what I could bring to the table. Dave Roberts knew it was a really shabby offer, but he said to me, I know this is not a good offer. I know this is not fair but I also know what you can do. He said, I need you to come back here. I need you to put your head down and I need you to kick tail like we all know that you can. And he said, and hey, you leave the rest to me. And what he did for me, um, I just can't put into words what it meant to me. There were people who lied on me in the past that I was, these are the kind of things that I meant, I lamented. Uh, Stephen A was unavailable. Stephen A was unreachable. Stephen A didn't show up to work. I mean, these are things I have never done, Sean. They were flat out lies. And Dave Roberts exposed the lies 
and the liars and basically exonerated me. But it couldn't happen until I actually got back. Once I got back and I conducted myself uh, devoid of the frustration that led to my departure, just put my head down and went to work and trusted him to do what he said he was going to do. While I was succeeding on radio in New York, he was pounding the pavement to find out all these things that people were saying about me and who was saying it. And once he proved them to be liars, they ended up being pushed out the door, um, ended up elevating. And ultimately TV came back calling uh, via Skip Bayless and Jamie Horowitz who was overseeing First Take at the time. And that is how my career began its resurrection. Who hired you back on TV? Who got your back on Jamie Horowitz. Jamie Horowitz, Jamie Horowitz uh, right. former executive at ESPN and NBC and FS1. Uh, he was in charge of First Take at the time. Skip Bayless had always wanted us to work together, thought that we would knock it out the park, and it convinced me to, to want to do it. And he convinced Jamie Horowitz to, to give me a shot where I'd come on every Wednesday, you know, with Skip. It turned out that only lasted about three weeks to a month. Whenever I was on on Wednesdays, we knocked it out the park. And within a month, Jamie Horowitz went upstairs, fought for me to be allowed to be back on television and got me a contract, uh, ironically at that time, uh, for the $1.3 million that I was making before I had gotten fired many years earlier. You know, what an incredible story. When you got back, you were a different Stephen A. You were a different person. And you weren't fighting, you weren't combative with management. You are you you took a an interest finally in in ratings and uh revenue and yeah. the things that keep all of us on the air. People, you know, there's there's aspects to our jobs. I always say thank you to the audience for giving me my microphone every day yeah. and my, that TV camera I have every night. Mm -hmm. Watch or listen, I'm done. It's over. They have the power to fire me. That's and right. Are you and it's up to us to earn their respect every day, whether they agree or disagree, but Correct. to do a show. Um, and we both work in businesses where people don't know that they if you they don't like you, some people don't like you, if competitors are jealous, yeah. they, they work overtime to get you fired. There are groups right. politically speaking, they wanted me off the air my entire career, Stephen. A. Yeah. You know about it, not many other the average person wouldn't know about it and I wouldn't expect them to. Um, what a phenomenal story. Look, I've got a, um, I want to remind people, by the way, thank you for joining this live signing. I was just told somebody wrote me that, you know, we have a substantial number of people uh, watching this uh, live signing. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, but uh, I'm being handed a bunch of questions from people that are watching. By the way, if you want to go to stephenasmithbook.com, you can see it right there on your screen. Uh, I can't, I, by the way, I'm, I've lost hearing. I started radio in 1987. I don't hear well, and I can't read without my reading glasses. So I apologize. Right. That he's not used to seeing me with glasses on. Um, but they're sending in a lot of questions. I mean, I just got handed this stack in two seconds. Um, here's a question, Alyssa in Tucson, Arizona. Which sports journalist, analyst, commentator did you most admire coming up? Who inspired you? And let me guess, Howard Cosell, speaking of sports, you actually talked about it. Brian Gumble was one. Howard Cosell was one. Who are your guys? Who did talk to? Howard Cosell and Brian Gumble. Yeah. Uh, Howard Cosell, because the minute he opened his mouth, you knew it was him. There was only one. Only um, one. And, and when you talk about having an impact, that's an impact where you are so distinct in your delivery, your presentation. Um, there is no imitation. I mean, people can try or whatever, but there's only one you. Uh, definitely Howard Cosell and his relationship with Muhammad Ali uh, really affected me because his willingness to stand up against conventional wisdom at that particular moment in time. The, he, people wanted him to call him Cassius Clay. He demanded to be called Muhammad Ali. And Howard Cosell said, you have a right to be called by the name that you choose. 
and respected him for that and respected him as a man. And that was they a great idea. They had a great relationship. And it, and, 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 it, and, and it emanated from the fact that Muhammad Ali knew that Albert Cosell was somebody that would stand up to the masses. He didn't, it didn't matter to him what level of scrutiny came in his direction. If he believed he was right, he was going to stand up for it. And of course, Muhammad Ali respected that. And then Brian Gumbel, I am a black man. And to see this man from the 70s on to do all the things that he has done, the versatility, you're on the NFL today, you're on, you know, you're on, uh, you know, in the Today Show for NBC, you're doing real sports on HBO now, you used to be on CBS. I mean, this man was an ex extraordinary reporter and newsman and sportsman, just a phenomenal journalist. And to me, my sister Linda, the same sister that had taught me to read and write, actually, she said to me, you want to aspire to be somebody, that man right there. Because you know there's a litany of, you know, I mean, he's facing criticism all over the place. They cannot touch him. He's just too great. And one of my greatest honors is that Brian Gumbel is a friend. That's why you've never seen me sit down for an interview with him because Brian Gumbel doesn't really interview friends and he considers me a friend. That's why the interview never happened. Who's a closer friend, me or him? No, I'm kidding. Stop. 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 Um, uh, <laughs> let's go to, let me go read uh, Chris's question. He's yeah. in Cul Culver City in California. What suggestions do you have when you're mentoring young people today, 20, 30 years old, um, and I get asked this question a lot. I'm dying to hear your answer. Give them the truth and trust their resiliency. Don't give them problems with no solution. Provide solutions to whatever problems, whatever maladies they may be facing, but give it to them truthfully. Because when you give youth the truth, they have the resolve and the intestinal fortitude to overcome anything. A, if they have the truth, B, if they're given a solution, and C, if they know they have support. It's very, very rare that you're going to see someone with youth on their side fold like a cheap tent, can't deal with the pressure, can't handle it at all. Not when they have support, not when they have the truth, and not when they have the answer to problems that are presented to them. And I think that's something that they that, that everybody, every mentor should know. That is, that is a great answer with the questions uh justin is in new jersey on your path to success how did you balance your time with your family including your siblings and you do have you dedicate the book to your mom and and your two daughters how do you balance it it's not easy you're on the road six months a year as you point out in the book well i really said to be specific over 200 days out of the year and it wasn't necessarily gone for six months or anything it's just that i was back and forth going in and out so much because i was covering the beat that's no longer the case for me now uh but when i was climbing uh before i became a dad uh my mentality was balance is overrated be on your grind wherever your passion lies is where your passion lies because you might be putting in overtime you know, in pursuit of your dreams and aspirations, but because it's your dreams and aspirations, excuse me, because it's your dreams and aspirations that you are in pursuit of, the fact of the matter is it never feels like work. So in that regard, I would tell you balance is not necessarily needed when it comes to work. Now, when it comes to balance between work and your personal life, then that means you're thinking about someone other than yourself. And it's not just about your passions. It's not just about your aspirations. It's about the love others feel for you and the, the need for reciprocation that they're aiming and aching for. And you do have an obligation to provide that, particularly when it comes to your children, but also when it comes to people you love and adore and cherish that you want to remain a part of your life. You owe them that. And if there's a way to find it, you should. And usually there is, because those people will always give more to you. So it's okay for you to give more to them, and you'll be just fine. You know, there's a part of me that's tempted to go through a lot more of the book and your experiences, and and you go into great detail, and all the people that you know in sports. I mean, you've lived quite a life. Um, the only comparable thing that I think we have in common is, as you have met all of the people in the sports world, you know, I'm doing it on the political side, um, but I'm a big fan of yours and a big fan of sports. 
Uh, but there's just I'm I'm getting handed a pile of questions, and I think if I don't ask a few more, I think people will be mad at me, and we're grateful that they signed in. By the way, I just want to want to tell people there's so much meat in this book. This book is raw. This book is honest. This book is forthright. You're going to learn a lot with this book. Um, you're going to apply a lot of the lessons about overcoming adversity, um, about how one. If you're ever going to be your better self, you got to look inside. Stephen A. Smith, is, he holds nothing back, no holes barred, which is all I would really ever expect from you, Stephen, because I know you. Um, what is your greatest takeaway from any Kobe Bryant interview? I'm a huge Kobe fan. Uh, TJ in Nebraska. Kobe Bryant may have been the most brilliant athlete I've ever encountered. He never went to college. He went straight out of high school to the pros, Lower Marion High School in Pennsylvania. Um, he spoke three languages fluently, Italian, Spanish, English. And by the time he passed away, had learned some Mandarin, Wow. In German, if I remember correctly. And this was a guy, I'll tell you a little story that happened. It's 2005, and I have, quite frankly, my television show that was on ESPN2. Kobe comes in after the whole Eagle County, Colorado sexual assault accusation and stuff like that, that he had to go to court and fight. Uh, before the case was dropped and settled out of court, if I remember correctly. Kobe Bryant, after that, comes and gives me the first sit-down interview. He sits down with me, Sean, and we're talking. And then afterwards, he and I talked privately. And I said, look, man, he said, I'm proud of you, bro. This is a nice show. You're doing good, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, man, they're saying that I got a chance to be the next Oprah. His exact words, F. Oprah, Harpo. That's what he said, F. Oprah. And he said the word. I'm just why? saying the letter. Well, he why? Said the, but why? Said, Harpo was the name of the studio she owned. Oh, I, know, I, know, I know that part, but why did he say? Why because did he he's say? telling me, don't think about just being an on-air talent. Own this. Own it. You know what I mean? own, the own the show. Make sure it's owned by you. Think ownership, not just being an on-air talent. You're bigger than that. That's what he it's told funny, me. It's funny you say that because I try to mentor people in our business, and I, you know, it's amazing. You've heard the term broke athlete. Yeah. They're also broke broadcasters. Yeah. You know, people that have a number of high earning years and they don't save any money. I'm like, what do you guys do? What, do, what are you doing here? Right. You, know, you, you look at the average NFL career, what is it, three and a half years? That's yeah. it. It, most people are not Tom Brady. They're not gonna be there when they're 45. Yeah. And, um, I never wanted to be a broke athlete. I mean, like I work for free. My first job paid me 19 grand a year. Yours yeah. paid 15 grand a year. $15,300. Right, and then you went to the Philly Inquirer. People may not know you started as a print guy. Um, and I think Kobe gave you the right advice because Oprah became a billionaire and he she owned her business, but she also expanded her business. Yes. Dr. Dr. Phil came under her umbrella. Uh, Dr. Oz came under her umbrella and she conquered daytime TV and yeah. you know took it to another level and then took the business to another level. I've always admired her myself. Let me yeah. ask, I don't like her politics, but I don't like yours either. Um, <laughs> Mike, Michael's in uh, New York, he writes, he has two questions. Looking back on everyone you interviewed throughout your career, well, hang on, I gotta ask this question while it's in my head. I'm gonna get to Michael in a second. You hosted for Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. Now, you said something. I didn't have time enough time on the radio show, even though we did a full hour, to dig deeper into this. But I got out of you that you have 
And by the way, he's signing books. That's why it's, you know, Stephen A. Smith book.com. If you want to get a signed copy of this great book. Um, but you filled in for Jimmy Kimmel. Yes, I did. So you it almost insinuated to me that you don't want to be pigeonholed into one category. And That's you right. think you're going to have a late night show one, one at some point and that you're interested in one or interested in other things. What are you interested in maybe doing? Because I'm doing what I want to do. First of all, I am interested in doing late night. I would love to be the heir apparent to Jimmy Kimmel. Um, I believe I can do it. I think that I can do it. Mm -hmm. Say what? You're funnier, you're smarter, you're better looking. Oh, then you go stop it. I, I would tell you, but, but see, I would throw everybody for a loop because I, you know, my politics would throw people off because I'd be fair to everybody, you know, and, and I'd listen to everybody. It wouldn't be one side. I'm not a one sided kind of guy. I'm right. one sided on issues. I'm not one sided on ideology. I don't believe in that. You know what? You want to know why these late night shows are failing? You know, my colleague, my friend Greg Gutfeld is kicking their ass. I'll tell you why. Because he's funny. And, you know, if you look at the ratings, go back to the, forget Johnny Carson. I mean, he, he had a 30 like, share. It was, so when you go back to the great years of Letterman and Leno and the competition that they had, you know, especially Leno. He just wanted to be funny. He went after everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, Letterman started that way. Then he got a little angrier, I felt, as he got older, a little more political. I don't think that helped him. But now it's, I don't care if you're watching Colbert or if you're watching Fallon or you're watching Kimmel. The, the, it's like a left-wing com comedy show. Mm -hmm. And they're alienating and pushing away half the country. I don't watch, watch their show because I don't think it's funny anymore. They, they're yeah. so Joe Biden. They won't even show Joe Biden who can't utter two, can't string two sentences together. Half of that's pretty funny if you air it, but they won't well, do it. It's political. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, you know, I don't watch much of it, but uh, assuming you're, you're correct in what you're saying, it, it should be a problem because the reality of the situation is just 350 plus Americans in this country. And at least 170 to 180 million things oh, like, seriously, like Sean Hannity. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and so we, we understand that. And whether you like it or not, that's their reality. And so when you look at it from that perspective, that's why I always tell people, I say something like that. I'm a black man. I'm a proud black man. I love the black community. I love my people, but black appeal is not what I'm in search of. I'm in search of mass appeal. I want everybody. And so in order to get everybody, you got to think about everybody. You got to think about what they want. You got to think about what they need. You got to think about what they like, what they dislike, how they feel, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, you know, thanks to the great Bob Iger, who now returned as the head of Disney, he was the one that made that happen for me, where I got an opportunity to host in place of Jimmy Kimmel one night. Um, and I, I, I still thank him for that to this very day. It's something that I want to do. Uh, but I also have my podcast, which I own and operate. It's mine. It's not in conjunction with ESPN. Wait a minute. The highest rated podcast or the most listened to podcast was mine, wasn't yes. it? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. You actually eventually passed Snoop Dogg. I beat out Snoop Dogg? <laughs> Just recently, though. Just recently, though. Because, you know, people go back to my library and listen to my podcast. It wasn't that way for the first couple of months, but <laughs> still now I'm stunned. You know, I'm stunned. I never expected that forever, but it happened. Okay? <laughs> it definitely did. But I, I say all of that to say that, you know, people were up in arms at the thought of you being on my podcast. And I'm like, why? And then they were like, well, you didn't go at him with tough questions. Like, stop. I wasn't there to challenge his politics. We all know what his politics is. I want you to know about him. I wanted Sean to talk about Sean, which Sean doesn't do too often. No, I said, so no. that's what it was. I had you on. I had Chris Cuomo on the next episode. Okay. No. I mean, it's like fair is fair. And it's like, that's what I'm about. I want people to look at me and know that 
You might not like what I said about you today, but you might love what I said about you tomorrow because I'm not attaching a characteristic to you. I go on a case. Why are you compared to my son's favorite team, the Dallas Cowboys? Oh, because I can't stand their fans. Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Dallas Cowboys fans make me sick. No, I mean, are you saying you can't? You, you and my son hit it off. You, you've talked to my son. No, no, no. I, I, your son's a good dude until he brings up the Cowboys. And then yeah. I don't like now, when he changes the subject, we're good. But when he's talking about the Cowboys, because they're all. I, I give up. All, I, 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 I don't want to talk about the Cowboys or Tim Tebow. All, all right, let me get back to I, I promised poor Michael in New York. He has two questions. Sure. Looking back on everyone you interviewed throughout your career, who, if you could, would you interview again today? And if you could go back and change one thing you did, what would that be? Good question. Wow. Um, the person that I would interview again that I have interviewed already is Alan Iverson. Because that's my little brother and I love talking to him. And no matter how open he gets, he's more open with me than he is with practically anybody. I love him dearly. That's that's my heart. He's a good dude. And I know a lot about him that a lot of people don't know. And I understand a lot of the reasons he made some of the decisions that he's made. Um, the person that I've never interviewed that I would love to interview uh, is Barack Obama. He's wow. one. He's one person that uh, uh, I've interviewed. And, and I got to tell you something else, too. Are you way, ready for this? Wait a minute. Sure. So I would like to interview Barack Obama. Yeah, if I was him, I would never talk to you. I would never talk to you. <laughs> By the way, I wouldn't if I was him either. You're not, you're not. First of all, you're going to interrupt him because his <laughs> liberal, his liberalism I, no, is I going to be you crazy inside of two no, minutes. You're wrong. Let me tell you why you're wrong. Okay. I would. I said this when he was president, and I meant it. Okay. It was very, and people wanted me to interview him, and I, I, I would absolutely do it. But it would be a hard interview to do. Yes. Because I respect the office. Yeah. Okay. I really, you know, people would always say to me that they'd ask this dumb question: Can you okay. say one thing good about Barack Obama? And I'd say, Yeah, I absolutely can, with no hesitation. He seems like a good dad. Okay. Is is what him and Michelle seem to have raised good kids, and I applaud them for that. It's a hard job, especially in the, the greatest first lady ever. But go ahead. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to argue with you about the first lady, okay. but you know, but his policies were a disaster, just okay. like Biden is a disaster. Even but you, you see, acknowledge that. See, see, well, listen, some listen. Go back to why you want to interview Barack. It's about you. It's not about me. I, I tell you that I, because as a black man, I'm just incredibly proud of who he is and how he represented the office. See, where I get you is that I always talk about the presidency as it pertains to their policies, the prism of history will tell us, because that's what I heard you say more than a decade ago. And I hold that against you every chance I get, because in the moment you're so heated and you're going off and you're painting gloom and doom, the world is just gonna end with these policies, you know? And I'm like, wait a minute, I heard you say during the Bush years, the prism of history. Well, how come we can't wait? And and that's how I get you. But I mean, talk that. about heat in the moment, pot kettle. You're that's exactly right. the same as I am. No, I'm not. But he, but here's the deal. When I think about him and how he conducted himself as a man in in the office, that matters to me because that's respecting the office, and that's very very important to me because we're not a dictatorship. We got. 100 senators. We got 435 congressional figures. Okay, we we're not. A, we got a Supreme Court. We're not a dictator. We collectively come together to ensure the checks and balances are in place. So we're not run by one person. So to me, how you act and how you conduct yourself matters. And when I think about him, and I think about what we want our community to be about, to stand for as it pertains to your class, your dignity, et cetera, those things are incredibly important and it sets a shining example for others to follow. So in that regard, I like not him. Not I'm not shocked not you not this. Not. 
There is one other person that's on my list to interview. Are you ready for this? Because this is going to blow you away. Do you know who I want to No, I'd love to give you one guess. Go ahead. Donald J. Trump. No. <laughs> oh. Do you, know, do you know who I want to interview? I, I, that was my guess. Who? Ted Cruz. Oh. Why Ted? I love Ted was on my show tonight. Yeah, I saw him. I saw him. Listen, a lot of people disagree with Ted. God knows I do. But he's no he's no idiot. No. He's smart. He's smart. And 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 not only is he smart, he'll come right back at you with anything that you ask him about. You're gonna have a conversation with him. He's not, and I don't know all the issues. I'm quite sure there was things, dicey situations that he found himself in that he might have run from. You got a constituency that came to answer to us. I don't know all of that. But I do know if he agrees to sit down with you, he's going to tackle whatever issue you want to tackle. Do you I know watched the interview by Cuomo one time, and I was impressed with how combative he was with Cuomo. Because Cuomo is not easy. I got a lot of respect for Chris Cuomo. And, and, and it's not easy. But I, I, I respect Ted Cruz's intellect. And I respect the fact that he will battle you. And I, and I like that. Did you know he went to Harvard? Yes. Did you know that Alan, Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz said he was yeah. probably one of the smartest students. He didn't agree with him. But one yeah. of the smartest people he ever yeah. taught. Yeah. And was ever in his class. And I don't know if you know this, he was the number one debate champion in the entire country. That I knew. That, that I knew. I mean, you it, know how I knew that? You know how yeah. I knew that? Because you told me that and I told you, I said, Sean, I think I could take him. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I think I remember that. No. no. <laughs> uh, how do I, I just so much, so many questions here. All right, I'm going to ask you one last question, but I want to remind this audience. Okay, I've got my book here, Straight Shooter, A Memoir of Second Chances and First Takes. Now, you're on this live signing. You can see Stephen A. He's signing books. This is about an autographed copy uh, of this book. You, uh, This book is going to make you want to cry. It's going to teach you a lot about life. You, I love to learn from other people's stories. I love to read biographies. I love autobiographies in particular. Um, and he tells it like it is. He holds back nothing. It is raw. At times it is, it is, it is painful to know what he's gone through, especially if you're a fan of Stephen A. like I am. Um, and then it is tragedy and the road to triumph with roadblocks and challenges and you know, falling along the way and picking yourself up, dusting yourself off and moving forward. Um, it's it's a phenomenal book. So I'm going to do one last question. I want to find a really, really good book here. I'm, I'm sorry, really good question here. It's a really good book that we're sure. talking about. Um, boy, this is, all right, here's a good one. I, I like this question. It's from, okay. Diane. she's in Wichita Falls in Texas. Okay. Where does this deep love of sports come from? And at what point in your life did you know being the voice of sports would be your life's work? And then I want to give an answer to that question of myself and see I compare notes with you. Go ahead. The deep love of sports comes from the fact that it saved my life. Because if it were not for my love of sports... I would have never discovered my passion. Without the passion, I probably would not have built my confidence enough to garner this belief in me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. And I probably would not have ended up succeeding. That love for sports also came from the fact that my father loved sports. And because he loved sports, the more I knew about sports, the more knowledgeable I became, the more I was able to dispel his notions that I wasn't smart, that I wasn't gonna be anything in my life. So it had a dual effect. And then, you know, to, to be a voice and to resonate where it really, really hit me um, was first when I became a columnist and people would react so vehemently to the things that I wrote, 
you know, when I sat up there and wrote that the Sixers were going down in five games to the Lakers in 2001, people throwing stuff at the TVs, wanted me fired and stuff like that. Um, to when I be, when I got on first take and I had that platform to really speak and articulate in such a fashion that it would resonate to the masses, I knew it was my calling. You know, I, I never aspired to be a politician. Uh, because you need too much assistance in order to pull it off. You got to cater the constituency, proverbially speaking, shake hands, kiss babies. And then after that, you got to, if you win, you got to go up on Capitol Hill and, and let you, you're the president, you got to have uh, one side of the aisle or the other supporting your policies. If you're a congressional or Senate figure, you need a bunch of people to sign off on what you want to do in order to get things done. So that never appeal to me. Instead, that bully pulpit, as they call it, that microphone, that camera, that lens, that magnetized potentially millions, the thought of that was a drug for me. Um, it's a drug. It, it's a high that I never come down from. And people say this about me all the time, Sean, and, and I guess it's actually true. Um, it doesn't matter how long I work. It doesn't matter how tired I am. You know, everybody says the same thing from my host, Molly Kiram on first take to colleagues who work with me. They've always said this about me. When those lights come on, that brother's wrong. And that's how I've always been. When the lights come on, it's just a, it's something inside of me that just takes over. It's so eerily similar to my story, and I'm not going to tell too much of it, but I used to, as a young kid, my parents would always tell me to shut off the radio. I didn't care about TV that much. I'd listen to late night, the pioneers of talk radio. Shut off that radio. My father's screaming at me, you know, and then he'd go and I'd have that little, you know, that white little earpiece and put it in my ear and I'd listen or I just put it lower. And then the first time I ever got behind a radio microphone, it was game, set, match. It was over. There was nothing else I wanted to do with my life. And I have no idea why. I, and when I first went on the air, immediately, like I talked, I, hello, how are you? Glad you're with us. 800 941. You know, I started talking with energy. I never learned that. It just came out that way. And I have no idea why. Kind of crazy. You know, look, um, a lot of things I want to say to you. I want to say to the, the, first of all, everyone that's been watching this, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for your questions. I hope you get your autographed copy. This is a live signing. It's Stephen A. Smith. Uh, book.com as you can see on your screen um you know for me to be able to do this with you honestly Stephen a is has been an honor i've known you all these years and it's funny you think you know someone and then i've learned so much about you that i never knew before and it just gives me this new level of respect and makes you love makes me love you that much more respect you that much more appreciate you that much more and the fact that you had the courage to open up like this is a testament to who you are. Um, I'm just honored to call you a friend, and, and I'm honored to have been able to work, do this with you tonight. Hope we can do it again. And uh, I know the book's going to be a top bestseller. It's been on the bestseller list on Amazon all week. And, uh, you know, you're an amazing man, and I hope people get their autographed copy. Well, let me say this before I let you go. I'm honored to call you a friend as well. We have we do go back a long ways. And it's amazing how our friendship has lasted this long, considering how much we disagree, how many times I've had to text you and educate you about some of the politics that you support. It's unbelievable. But 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 I've often told people this, you know, this guy doesn't care who you are. As I say, all he cares about is whether you're liberal or conservative. That's the only thing he does. Anything else is perfectly fine with you. That's not true. That is if not true. Liberal, if you're a liberal, you're going to have a problem with Sean Hannity. That's just the way that it is. But but I I really appreciate I really appreciate you doing this for me. Thank you so much. And I, and I tell you, it's amazing as you get older, the friends that you make along the way. Friends sometimes don't realize the kind of impact they have on your life because they force you to want to do better, to want to think better and to want to be as fair minded as you possibly can be. Because when people stand up for you the way you have for me in the past, and you most certainly did. When I got suspended, you stood up and you talked about how wrong it was what happened to me when people have come at me on a multitude of other issues in the past. 
You've always stood up for me. And, I, and when you disagreed with me, you still defended my character, even when you disagreed with me, which is all I can ask for. And I always appreciate that. So I'm grateful. And those kind of things just make you want to be better. No matter where I'm at right now, no matter how great things are going, no matter how successful I may be, there's still a mountain for me to climb. And I know that I can get there because of the people that I've surrounded myself with who get in my ear, who talk to me. And whether I agree or disagree, I know they have my best interest at heart. And you're one of those people. So I really, really thank you for it. I appreciate our friendship. And I thank you for doing this. Stephen A. Stephen A. Shooter, memoir on second chances and first takes. Live signing, get it right there, Stephen A. Uh, Smithbook.com. Uh, my friend, love you. Thank you for the time. Yeah. All of you out there, thank you for joining us. I know you're going to love this book. And it was my honor to be with you, Stephen A. And I'll uh, catch up with you real soon. Congratulations on yes. success. You're the Thanks, buddy. Take it easy, my friend. Bye bye. Talk to you. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.